welcome everyone uh, to the first uh, segment of our um, APSA pre-conference um, for the Migration and Citizenship section. Uh, you guys are all welcome to, uh, to join, you're all here to join us and I really appreciate it. Um, this is something I wanna thank everybody who's helped me put this together. Um, I will thank people at various points throughout the day. Uh, first, I wanna thank um, Emily and Sophia for doing a lot of logistical work and making this happen. Uh, this is being run and sponsored by the um, by the by UBC's uh, Center for Migration Studies, and so everybody who's in charge of making decisions there, including Antje, who you all know, and a lot of other people. So I want to want to thank everybody. I also want to take a second to acknowledge that we're on the uh, traditional ancestral uh, and unceded territory of the Musqueam people, and I, I would like us all to take a second to sort of think about what that means for us. And I know we're all, a lot of us are in far flung uh, far flung places. Um, and so just take a second to reflect. Um, and so with that, uh, I would like to just kick things off and I'd like to um, throw things over to Yang Yang, uh, my colleague Yang Yang, who's gonna moderate an absolutely awesome panel uh, with a bunch of absolutely awesome panelists. And they're gonna tell us all about the various issues around language and how we, uh, how we ought to study and treat uh, migrants. Um, and so with that, please uh, Yang Yang, take it away. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm an assistant professor of political science at the University of British Columbia, but right now I'm based at Harvard for two years. Um, and really the goal of today's panel, the goal of this conversation is to help us scholars think about and select the language that we use more carefully in an inclusive way that still acknowledges and respects the experiences of the people we study. Um, I study migration and the political dynamics around migration in global South contexts. And, you know, I've been struggling and thinking about this for a while. Um, and so some of the questions we're going to discuss today are, uh, what are the problems with the language that we're using? Um, you know, the goal for this is within academia, but also, of course, this translates to practitioners, policymakers, the media, the general public. What is the debate? Is there disagreement amongst ourselves about language around migration? Can we reach a consensus? And if so, you know, moving forward, are there some best practices on the language that we should be using? Um, I'm very excited to introduce our panelists today. Basically, these are people who um, I have reached out to and had like some email conversations individually about this topic. And I thought given um, that we have this pre-conference, why don't I just bring all these smart people all together and we can have a, a hopefully open, um, relatively informal conversation. So I'm going to do a quick introduction for each of our panelists, um, basically just saying your name and your um, affiliation. But I also want to give each of you, you know, after I say your name and affiliation, please tell us what you're researching and um, how you've, you know, how you've come to be re related to this topic, to think about this topic. Um, so I'm going to go in alphabetical order based on first name. First, we're going to start off with Beth Wellman, Elizabeth Wellman. Um, Beth Wellman is a visiting assistant professor in the Department of Political Science at Williams College. Beth, I'll let you take it away for a few sentences. Hi, um, good morning and good afternoon and good evening to everyone who is attending. It is an absolute privilege to be here and to be part of this conversation. Um, my, I am a visiting assistant professor at Williams College, but um, I also have a research affiliation with the African Center for Migration and Society at uh, Wits University in Johannesburg, South Africa. And I have a number of uh, my colleagues there that might be on this call today, so at uh, this conference. So thank you all for being here as well. Um, I, uh, my research really uh, is primarily focused on thinking about um, migrant political participation from the perspective of migrants uh, as immigrants and uh, political, uh, their political uh, kind of subjectivities vis-a-vis -vis their positionalities to their state and their home countries. Um, and so I came to this, you know, I came to this question thinking, um, a lot about how different um, states think about their citizens or think about their, the people from their country that no longer live there. Um, and But also really thinking a lot about migrants and migration and the language around this as a, you know, 
based on these questions of positionality to the state and how much the state makes these refugee migrant categorizations and therefore kind of in turn how these designations can be politicized and weaponized as well as really the difference between you know access to rights and services within host country contexts as well so um you know these are these are the questions that i'm thinking about particularly within transnational contexts and i'm just looking forward to the conversation oh and i also want to say it is a related conversation and we can talk about this as well but questions of what to call immigrants, whether it's diaspora communities or expatriates or immigrants is also a very hotly contested question within our emerging field of scholarship. So looking forward to this, look, very much looking forward to this conversation. Thanks so much, Beth. And in case you guys don't do it, I'll, I'll make a plug for your recent work. Um, be sure audience members to check out Beth's book when it comes out, The Diaspora Vote Dilemma. She also has a recent APSR article on, on that topic that came out this year. Okay, next we have Kelsey Norman. Kelsey is a fellow for the Middle East and director of the Women's Rights, Human Rights and Refugees Program at the Baker Institute for Public Policy at Rice University. Take it away, Kelsey. Thanks so much, Yang Yang. Thanks to all the panelists and to everyone for joining in this conversation. Um, I guess I'll just quickly say that this is a, a question and dilemma I've been thinking about, I guess, since the inception of my research project that was my, my PhD dissertation and now eventually um, became my book that uh, was published this last year, which is tied, I guess, I'll, in Ying Ying's uh, <laughs> vein, I'll, I'll go ahead and plug it. Um, so it's called Reluctant Reception, Refugees, Migration and Governance in the Middle East and North Africa. And you can even see from the title, like this is something I'm still struggling with, right? But I made the decision in, in my work, just based on initial field work I was doing in, um, in, in Egypt, but then in other comparative contexts too, um, to include both migrants and refugees in, in the study I was doing. And that seemed like sort of a no brainer because in the context in which I was looking, people who had these varying statuses, stati, statuses, uh, were living with each other in, in such similar circumstances. Um, you know, joining the same community organizations, living in, in, in neighborhoods with each other, going to various schools that were, you know, allegedly for refugees or asylum seekers, but often would include people who didn't have that, that status as well. Um, and even in speaking with host country governments, these groups were so often considered sort of the same population. So for me, it was important to include people of a variety uh, of, of having different statuses within, within this study. Um, but I received so much pushback from that, especially early on when starting off the PhD and, and later on um, in giving talks about this work, people would ask, well, but are you, are you looking at refugees or are you looking at migrants? And it's, it's clear that this is, a, uh, you know, it's, I think, Rebecca will probably talk about an alleged binary that we need to um, to to work or to to discuss further, uh, if not break down. So um, I'll I'll say that, and then also um, Lama and I have thought about quite a bit about this, um, and we have a, a piece in the European Journal of International Relations, as well as some some pieces in popular media that also look at this discussion. And I think we'll say more about that. So I'll just kind of stop there, but I'm just happy that we're having these discussions because back when I was a grad student, um, they, they weren't uh, at the forefront of, of our, our field of study. So I'm grateful. Thanks for having me here today. Thanks, Kelsey. Um, next, we have Lama Murad, who is an assistant professor at the Norman Patterson School of International Affairs at Carleton University. Thank you, Yang Yang. And, you know, I'll, I think if we all give our, our big thanks for bringing this conversation together, we'll probably take half the time of this uh, conversation. So I will just say that I echo both Beth and Kelsey's uh, points about that. And I'm really excited to have this conversation with you all. And I really, you know, and there are a number of people I know in the audience that are also, you know, people I've thought about these questions with and who I think can contribute immensely to this conversation. So I hope that we have it even more openly than just among us panelists. Um, in terms of my own research, uh, my doctoral work and, and now my book project has looked specifically at the role of local governments, uh, particularly in, in Lebanon, in governing the presence of, of Syrians uh, and, and you know, we can say Syrian refugees in this context um, it, post 2011. 
and sort of breaking down the, the ways in which uh, governance of migrants and refugees is often assumed to be at the sort of national level or at the international level, but too often sort of ignores the subnational context and the role of local governments in that process. And in that vein, I've done work on categorization and labeling in the, the sort of domestic realm and the ways in which, uh, you know, the, the, the same population can be viewed in really different ways and labeled differently with differential effects across, you know, in different spaces within one national context. Um, and the effect that that has, uh, you know, on those populations, but also the ways in which categories in one realm can translate into sort of pressures for transformations in another. And that's, so I've published some of that work with, with Maya Yanmir in the Journal of Refugee Studies. And most recently I, I have a piece out um, on, on sort of the deferring uh, labels used for Syrians uh, in Lebanon, including, you know, brothers, workers, migrants, uh, refugees, and the sort of complexity of understanding that both historically and, and sort of in a grounded social context. Uh, and then, yes, as, as Kelsey said, you know, in, a, in the global governance realm, uh, her and I have, have written together and thought together a lot about the ways in which, you know, states might strategically uh, use uh, these, this binary uh, to either um, sort of more strategically choose certain migrants uh, versus others to allow entry. Uh, and so, so I'm interested in this both at the global level and sort of in the domestic and subnational context um, across these ways. So I'm happy to have these conversations with, with all of you. Thank you, Lama. Uh, next, we have Rebecca Hamlin, who is an associate professor of legal studies and political science at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Thank you so much, Yang. -Yang. I'm just so thrilled to be a part of this conversation with so many. Um, fantastic scholars. So um, yeah, this is a topic that I have been interested in and thinking about and writing about for a long time now. Um, media characterization or media portrayal of um, border crossers has always been an interest of mine. Language about um, um, people who cross borders has been a longstanding interest of mine. And uh, most recently, I wrote a book that came out this spring, um, Crossing, uh, which is, there it is, thank you, <laughs> um, which is about um, what I call the migrant refugee binary and um, sort of a, a, a critique of its um, deployment, um, which we can get into in a little bit. But um, I, I'll also say I'm currently in the, in the late stages of editing a special issue of the Journal of Immigrant and Refugee Studies with um, my friend and colleague, Lamis Abdelati, um, who also has a fabulous book that touches on these um, issues, but she and I are doing a, uh, editing a special issue that'll be out in early 2022 on the politics of the migrant refugee binary, which is showcasing seven um, emerging um, works on this issue, looking at it from a lot of different angles. So if you're interested in this topic, I think that this special issue is shaping up to be a really interesting intervention on it as well. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, and finally, we have Stephanie Shorts, who is an assistant professor in the University of Southern California's Department of Political Science and International Relations. Hi, thanks so much. I'm also just really excited to be here with such amazing scholars and this amazing uh, uh, what's the equivalent of a, a mantle for women? A, a, I, it doesn't ring, roll off the tongue, but to be among such amazing women scholars and friends um, and to see so many people in the audience uh, excited to engage on issues of language. Um, and I, uh, that's really helpful for me. Um, I came to this topic sort of through two ways. The first is that my work on people returning to their countries of origin after civil war, a lot of that is based in studying how people label themselves and the other people in their community and how processes of displacement can actually create new social groups. Um, and we can talk about that more in terms of labels as not just something that governments deploy, but that are sort of an outcome um, organically in communities themselves. And so on the one hand, I was studying the development of labels of 
returnee or non-migrant or in the local language, whatever that was. Um, and on the other hand, I was also witnessing a time between Burundi and Tanzania of government manipulation of who got to stay where and the deployment of terms like economic migrant or narratives about like they're only coming just because they're hungry to try and end the hosting of Burundian refugees in Tanzania and force people home again. And so from the policy side, looking at repatriation, I became very interested in how sort of, and learning from Rebecca's work and, and Lemo's work and Kelsey's work, learning how these categories are deployed by policymakers and thinking about how to ameliorate this razor, razor sharp definition and think about innovative, particularly innovative regional solutions from the policy side. And so um, that's how I've come to sort of labels from many different directions. Um, and I'm excited to, to keep talking about this. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, and to the audience members, there are so many of you. I'm very impressed. Um, I, I want to make sure that you're also participating in this conversation. I'm going to make sure we open it up to a Q&A um, with plenty of time at the end. But also, if there's just a question on your mind while this conversation is going on, feel free to put it in the chat or DM me, and I will try to read them out as they come up. All right, so let's kick off this conversation. Um, let's just start off with the question about how we label the people that we study. Um, terms like migrants, asylum seekers, refugees, forced migrants, internally displaced people, voluntary migrants, forcibly displaced people. Um, from Rebecca's book, people who cross borders, border crossers. There's also non-migrants, people who decide to stay. What about return migration? There are just so many terms out there, terms obviously I've used myself. Um, but, you know, inherent in all of this language, there is a binary. There is a refugee migrant binary, or put another way, sort of the forced or conflict-driven migration versus voluntary economic migration. Um, and we know from a lot of work, including the research of people, our panelists today, that um, the, there's a lot of troubling implications of this binary. First, that it doesn't capture the complexity of migration. Um, it also can imply deserving or undeservingness of being in a place. Um, so I'm going to you know, open this up to the panelists. What do you see as the problem with the language that we use? Is there a problem? Um, I'm going to start off with Rebecca and then I'll just sort of move through the, the panelists. Also, if the panelists have a two finger, if that's still a thing, they can raise your hand or wave at me or DM me. So I'll try to distill my argument down <laughs> into a very brief little um, sound bite here. But yeah, my concern with the, my, the way the migrant refugee binary is often used is it's often not used as two sort of equally valid ways of crossing borders. It's often used rather to distinguish deserving from undeserving people. And I should be clear that I'm not necessarily saying that I don't think that there should be a formal legal category that um, provides people with refugee status for people who meet the legal definition of a refugee. I'm much more concerned about the way that the terms are used in conversation outside of the formal legal realm. In particular, I'm very concerned about the ways in which the concept of a refugee is often um, used in an essentialist way. And by that, I mean, there, there's this, um, often unspoken assumption or implication that there is this very like essential quality of refugee-ness or refugeehood that some people possess and the vast majority of people don't possess and that there can be a process of regular regularized inquiry designed to discover the truth to, as like a sorting hat that will find it out. And the UNHCR, you know, practice manual actually like explicitly makes this um, makes this essentialist point by saying people are refugees whether or not they are granted refugee status. 
um, true refugees will be refugees, whether or not anyone acknowledges that. And I, and I understand why from an advocacy perspective, one might take that position, but I think it has some real unintended consequences that are becoming less and less unintended over time as we become aware of those consequences, which, um, and by that, I mean that it can really um, be invoked to imply that we owe nothing to people who don't fit with the refugee definition. Um, and sometimes it's invoked in moments that, are, that I find to be extremely um, inappropriate um, because it implies a total lack of deservingness from people who are sort of obviously um, suffering and vulnerable. And so it's, it's that um, invocation of the binary that I'm most concerned about pushing back on in my work. Do any of the other panelists want to react to that explicitly? Um, okay, well, you know, I, I don't think we amongst ourselves disagree on a lot of things, but I am also interested in seeing if there is a little bit of debate. I think there may be a slight debate with, from what I recall reading uh, Lama and Kelsey's piece. So I'm gonna turn it over to, to one of you. Do you want to go Lama or do you? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm happy to start us off. I've been thinking about this Rebecca quite a, a, a bit and I'm so happy to to have this conversation because it's there's also uh you know in my own work I sort of have this tension right where on the one hand when I'm you know in the work that I do on on Syrian displacement it's very 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 obvious that I that that process of framing uh you know for example the participation in the labor force as a delegitimizing claim uh, for refugeehood is very, very problematic, right? It's it's very, and, and that binary uh, is used in, in Lebanon, for example, I have, you know, I cite mayors, for example, that told me, you know, what well, these people are not refugees, they are working, right? And I think that that's, that's a problematic sort of uh, use of the fact that people, you know, uh, have the right to migrate for economic reasons and have you know have the right to pursue economic um certainty or security um and that that doesn't necessarily delegitimize their other motivations for for movement right um i think the tension that i see and i actually don't think that there's a big tension between you know what rebecca is saying and what kelsey and i have written about uh, particularly in that atlantic piece that i think you're referring to yang yang um, I think the difference is whether we believe that uh, trying to um, ensure the protection of a, of a refugee category is inherently harmful to other forms of border crossers. I think, and that's something I think I'm, I'm really interested in engaging with. I think there's no question that both Kelsey and I, you know, agree with Rebecca that there are moments in which that binary can be used to uh, project sort of false undeservingness, uh, which is not the claim that we make. Um, but I'm, I'm really interested in understanding whether how, recognizing, and you know, I just yesterday, you know, reread Haddad's work for my global governance of displacement class. So it's, this is really fresh in my mind, you know, whether recognizing that compulsion, right, and, and sort of some forms of uh, movement that are more coercive uh, deserve, you know, should be granted different forms of protection, uh, whether that in and of itself, so we can, you know, we can all agree, I think probably on this panel that the, the very narrowness of the refugee convention is not something that we want to uphold, but does maintaining some distinction between a highly, co you know, high, more coercive motivations for movement uh, versus more, you know, whether that in and of itself is harmful to uh, migrants at large. Uh, I think that might be, um, I don't know if it's a point of, of, of disagreement, but that might be where some of the disagreement is. Kelsey? Great. Um, yeah. It, this is, I mean, it's not an easy question to answer. And I, I agree with Loma that I don't know if we 
disagree on fundamental things, uh, Rebecca. And I, I had the pleasure of, of reading your book last week. So it's finally like, it's, it's very fresh in my mind and I, I was so engaged by it and I find many of your arguments so compelling. And I think for me, one of the most compelling arguments uh, that you make is the is that part of why I think those who would be incredibly um, who might push back against this idea of, of flattening this binary uh, are those who who want to preserve um, the right to asylum or the right the right to flee the right to enter another country's territory on the grounds of um, you know whatever the, the narrowly defined categories of, of the convention um, in with, with the fear that 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 would lead to an even more narrow protection space going forward right and i think you make a, a powerful argument saying that that hasn't worked so far <laughs> that we see too much uh to i mean in our own context in the us or i mean people are joining from all over presumably but sort of globally we see this um narrowing this narrowing space and this narrowing uh or this this uh limited um, sense that, that 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 argument is working and that it doesn't matter why people are, are uh, leaving their their home countries um, the the desire to minimize that from uh, sort of globally but especially from sort of Western democracies is is growing so I think there's there's a powerful argument there but I, I agree with Lama's question which I think you know it's this this point sort of boils down to does does upholding a category of individuals who are entitled under international law to enter another country's territory because of asylum, because of seeking refugeehood, um, does that necessitate that or necessarily demonize other individuals? And I I'm not entirely convinced that that that's the case, and that um, I mean I guess you say that you're not against sort of upholding some sort of category, um, but I just wonder. It from I guess a normative perspective, if that's the if that's the way to go, and I think in in terms of the article that that Lama and I wrote, and as well as the the popular piece in the Atlantic, um, which Yingying I think is, is is referring to as maybe in contention with some of uh, Rebecca's arguments, I I think we were there trying to argue that uh, in terms of refugee resettlement, there is um, this growing focus or growing emphasis on refugees as uh, economic, uh, potential economic contributors to a country that might be willing to, to receive them, right? Um, so uh, the danger then of, of um, collapsing those categories is that refugees might only be selected based on their potential economic uh, contributions, right? So I think that was the, the, the danger that we were highlighting with some of those pieces. But anyway, I've, I've talked too much, so if others want to, to jump in. Can I add a two pointer to that? Sorry, Yang, I'll be very brief, but just to add to Kelsey's, uh, um, you know, reflection on the, the EJIR piece, I think, you know, one, the, the harm or the sort of the, the crux of what we were trying to do there was not, was actually to say that this, and it, you know, uh, Kelsey and I actually, the, the impetus behind that project started from a very similar starting point to yours, Rebecca, of this really strong aversion to the way that this sort of, refugee migrant category was being uh, sort of used in, in media to, to demonize sort of one or the other. And what we were trying to argue there is that, you know, states actively transform these categories. You know, they themselves by, through their actions also shape uh, who is, um, you know, whether refugees are, are continue to be pursued uh, for economic or other means is, is, a, is sort of an active state strategy as well. And so states can't just talk about these categories as if they're sort of out there in the world, they're also transforming them themselves, right? So it was really a, a, an attempt to sort of challenge that, um, but I'm, I'm, I wanna hear the rest of the, the panelists. Um, okay, I, I'm already just so, excited about the productivity of this conversation. Um, I wanted to just uh, kind of pick up a couple of threads that were discussed here, um, talking about motivations for migration and the question of coercion, um, I think really does interplay into this question of, you know, a lot of the discourses that I've been exposed to, like talk about this idea of a genuine refugee and how whether, you know, um, uh, and, you know, we, there's a, you know, I think there's 
I, and I think there's been a movement away of talking about, you know, um, like forced migration um, within the recognition of that, how much that deprives um, migrants of the agency, um, as well as, you know, not really recognizing, you know, kind of the, the privileges associated with mobility, as well as involuntary immobility. And, um, you know, the, uh, the major the multiple dimensions of why and how and who uh, is able to move and under what conditions they do. Um, but to bring uh, to bring into I think part of this often also has to do with both the difficulties of temporality, um, particularly in terms of when we think about like refugee versus migrant migration and assumptions of whether things are short term or whether things are long term and, um, you know, the aspirations of, of emigration or, if, if, you know, whether or not it is a temporary or a much more long term situation. Um, how we think about, you know, under what conditions are coercive um, when we think about climate change, when we think about economic, um, you know, economic crisis and catastrophes, um, in addition to political turmoil that might not even meet the definition of a civil war, but just um, in really incredibly unstable contexts. Um, so the temporality aspect, the different, like how are we defining coercive, and also just this kind of um, difficulty between individual designations of refugee status determination, um, as well as um, you know, larger recognitions of uh, categories of migrants or gr from groups of particular places um, when, uh, when we have kind of these longer, you know, these kind of more blanket designations of refugee status, um, what, how, how the interplay between individual and collective um, really has pretty high stakes for, um, for both states as well as um, for the individuals themselves. Thanks, Beth. Um, Stephanie, and then, you know, I'm sure all of you are, want to respond. Yeah, I just wanted to pick up on a couple of through lines um, and kind of think through how to progress this conversation, because I think there are a lot of um, points of agreement, and there are also some, and will be continued to be some unresolved normative questions moving forward, because this is an ongoing, very active, living uh, debate. Um, and I think on the one hand, we've sort of recognized the dangers in which these categories are deployed and in which these hardened categories and hardened labels of migrant, refugee, uh, economic migrant, and the ways in which they can be deployed to the detriment of both refugees and migrants. Um, and, and we've also recognized, I think, Beth, this idea behind that of coercion and agency. Um, and the need to recognize that you can be coerced and still have agency at the same time. And what that means then for policy solutions, right? If you are coerced but still have agency at the same time, perhaps you can be a refugee with a work permit. Um, and I think for me and where my future research wants to go is looking at why legally and as an advocacy community, we have been almost exclusively focused on non refoulement and at the point at which the labels matter in, or, or are made to matter, I should say that policymakers make those labels matter and not about the subsequent rights in country, right? Because we have much less visible advocacy for, for example, refugees having the right to work in the same way that we have advocacy or needed advocacy for labor migrants and, and all of these things that are put in different uh, piles. Um, not to say that, that advocacy is not needed or uh, continues to be needed, right? But they're just separated in terms of conversation. And so for me, part of the issue is why we're not upholding the right to work, the right to freedom of movement, the right to all of these things that are also part of this convention. And so, from a normative policy perspective, I'd be interested to hear from the panelists and from the audience as well, if anyone has engaged with Michael Doyle's work on the Model Mobility Treaty, which sees to put the protections of a refugee not sort of next to and in contrast with migrants, but kind of create a, an inclusive pyramid that sort of this big, big, big sort of general set of rights that applies to students and travelers and this, and then the 
increasingly protected rights as sort of the level of coercion and the inability to return increases. It's this sort of general thing that I think is being put out there as an idea in order to try and get us to think away from, do we open or close the refugee definition? Um, and then, and really quickly, one thing I also wanted to mention, we're talking a lot about the deployment of labels. Um, and when I was invited to, to take part in this conversation, I was trying to think, how do I use words and, and what words am I using and how do I wanna use them in the future? I'm like going from the dissertation to the book and how do I wanna use these labels, right? And, and how do I wanna be true to the folks who gave me their time and shared their stories with me? Um, which is one of the most important things for me. And because these labels are active and living and in our world, many of the people I spoke to identified themselves as refugees. So much to the point that they, they even identified the UN as their government, right? If they were living in a refugee camp. Um, and it wasn't, simply a label to them, right? There was so much more beneath the label about what it meant to be called a refugee and to identify as a refugee. The same with being identifying as a, a repatrié or um, a returnee and, and that these, in some cases, those labels were fluid, right? And certain things had to change in their life for them to stop identifying as a returnee and start identifying first as a Burundian. And I think that one of the things I would like to see in the conversation going forward is a recognition also of the fluidity of labels for people and as the multiple levels of layering that we sometimes allow for ourselves and not for um, coerced uh, uh, people who move in, in coerced fashions, right? Um, as having multiple layers of, of different and intersecting identities um, that get wrapped up in those labels. Wow, this is terrific. I'm, I'm going to turn it back to the panelists to respond. I think um, maybe just to summarize a little bit, we're all in agreement that, you know, this binary has had a lot of harmful um, implications and but I think maybe if I could pick out where we might disagree or we might, we're still trying to figure it out is um, what do we do about it? Do we basically not have categories like in our writing, in the way we present this? We sometimes in my work now, I you'll see me, I'll do like a big search and replace of like all these terms and just put in migrant or border cross. I'm like, well, no, sometimes I need these and I'll go back and change them. Like, do we, do, should we not have categories? Should we have more categories and be more specific about the types of people we're talking about? Um, I see in the chat, Colette has asked about like, what, what recommendations do we have? And I think that'll be a big part of our conversation moving forward. The other thing I wanted to recognize that like that is, you know, in terms of categorization, how do we recognize that some situations, maybe there is a greater level of coercion versus others? Like, is there, is it a continuum? How should we be thinking about this? Um, and lastly, you know, to the point where um, maybe, I, I also want to use the language that has been, um, for the people that I've interviewed, they've used, you know, so like they've told me things like I'm fleeing or I'm running. Um, do we not use that language anymore either? Um, and, and I don't feel great about that either. So these are some of the things that I'm struggling with. It sounds like we're all sort of struggling with that. Um, with that, who, who would like to, <laughs> to jump in here? And I think for the panelists, if you, I mean, you know, we can just have a conversation. So feel free to just unmute and, and talk. You don't need me to, yeah, Rebecca. I mean, I guess the thing that I most want and think is most important is what we're all doing right now, which is for us as scholars, as advocates, as, as people who are interested in and paying attention to this issue to have more conversations about exactly what we mean when we use the words that we say. Because I think the thing that really inspired me to want to write the book that I wrote and, and 
and frustrates me to this day is when people allow the concept of a refugee or the category of a refugee to do a lot of really heavy lifting in terms of normative work um, without having to have um, in, in place of having to have the most difficult ethical conversations that I think we need to be having about what the privileged of the world owe to the less privileged of the world. What, what, um, how, you know, how much violence we're willing to accept, tolerate at our borders in order to protect our privilege, et cetera. And I think that oftentimes because those conversations are so fraught and difficult and often unproductive, instead um, advocates and, and politicians and, and scholars alike fall back on, well, are these people refugees or not? As if the answer to that question sort of excuses all of the stuff that, that comes along after it, if the answer is no. And, um, and so that's, what, that's why I think that just talking about it more and, and therefore thinking more about the words that we're using um, is a huge first step because it gets away from just sort of letting the word refugee be like a shorthand for a deserving person to whom we owe things because then the default is people who don't fit with that quite narrow as someone mentioned and I talk about a lot in the book Eurocentric and dated category um, that can only be stretched so far um, you know letting it do so much of the work for us. I'm just um I'm I'm just absorbing everything that's that's being said and it's uh it's such a it's a it's such a refreshing conversation because I feel like I've I'm sure it sounds like all of us have struggled sort of per, uh, singularly or individually with all of this um and I'm kind of wishing now I could go back and just rewrite the section of my book where I try, where I try to tackle some of how I was thinking about all this but you know I think I think uh, at least what I did um in 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 the dissertation but also in writing the book was kind of come up with a subsection and I guess it's kind of like a disclaimer right to say like I am going to use some of these words but I also acknowledge that it's messy and that people don't fit in these categories and I'm going to try to use the words that people used when when talking to me about what their circumstances were what their status was what have you but at the same time then we are of course by by continuing to utilize those um Re reinforcing this this system right I think that, that there is an acknowledgement in that and I guess I wish now that I had just done a bit more legwork um so so it's not just sort of putting this you know on the back burner um and then looking at all these issues that that I was interested in in the research um and and I think probably could have been more critical but it is hard as Yang Yang as you were saying you know are, are, do we just sort of do we do we just reiterate the categories that people are telling are telling us to describe their own selves and circumstances, or what what is our role then? Um, I guess just to include further criticality as we discuss the circumstances. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if I have an easy solution. I guess yeah, I'd be curious to hear what others have done um, in their work. Um, I was trying to think of like so we've been talking about best practices or how do we as can we come together on a, on a set language and I think obviously that 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 we're not obviously but I think there isn't an easy solution here and there probably isn't an agreed upon language and I think that Kelsey what you're describing and Rebecca what you're describing is a sort of radical transparency um, in how we deploy the terms and an acknowledgement of what we're doing um, <laughs> why we're doing it in particular within a specific context. Because I do think that the usage of these words takes on different um, normative downstream effects in, in different contexts. And, and so for me, I think we can agree that there are certain terms that for the most part, um, we've had sort of a debate about within academia and within the policy world, we don't use the word flood anymore, right? And it used to be super common, right? Um, and we've all kind of agreed that we're gonna erase that from our literature because it's really detrimental and dehumanizing and all of these things. But that took a while to get there. Um, and it took some honest debate and critique and, and thought. And I think we're just in the middle of this. And, and so in, in the meantime, 
I, I think in I, sort of this radical transparency in our writing and acknowledgement of usage of these in different contexts. Um, and I, I, may, I, I may want to reserve the right to use different terms in different contexts. For example, if I am interacting with policy actors, I know Yang Yang, this is one of your questions, if we're doing a grant with the World Bank, I may be pro, more proactively pushing back against their use of categories in my sort of back, uh, you know, behind the scenes discussion with them because it's a part of the advocacy. Um, and then when I have to put words on paper in part for my job, because we have to put words on paper for our jobs, then I might choose radical transparency um, and say, I have to, I have, I'm choosing this word for this reason um, until we as a policy community and as a normative community catch up for until we can almost invoke the change that we're trying to, to identify the problem, right? Until we can actually change what this problem is, we're gonna be left with these words. And so, the only solution I can find then is, is a, a, trans, a transparency in why we're choosing what words we're using. Um, I just wanna agree with that and also amplify a couple of the other points that are coming out, and especially in terms of this idea of radical transparency, but also just not taking these terms for granted, You know, um, making sure that they are contextualized very specifically within the contexts of, you know, um, either the groups of people that we're studying or the larger political and policy processes that we're studying, um, both in terms of not just kind of picking up and discursively taking these um, categorizations for granted, but also really under, you know, kind of contextualizing the potential political history of them, as well as also the individual subjectivities of how people are defining themselves. I mean, I think it also really has to do with kind of the level of analysis that your scholarship is taking um, based on whether it's, you know, a very fine grained, you know, qualitative and, you know, uh, where you're interview in-depth interviews with um, different uh, with groups of migrants, or you're talking about and interrogating these state and policy practices, just to, you know, both in terms of the radical transparency of why you're using the work you're using in your scholarship, but also where these terms are originating from within the um, larger level of analysis of the, the context that you're studying. Sorry, Yang Yang, did you want to go? Okay. I'd also love to hear from you. You're you're not just the chair of this conversation, you're part and parcel of it. So it'd be good to hear your thoughts as well. Um, though I appreciate the summary as well. But um so I've got a, so I think there's a couple of things that I feel are so we're we're circling kind of on and around. And so the first I think is you know recognizing who is using the category and 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 for what purpose, right? And I would say, you know, to Beth's point even if you're doing sort of individual level analysis that's looking at subjectivities, recognizing that those subjectivities are also shaped by, you know, the category, the ways in which these categories are used by local officials, national officials, media, because, you know, our subjectivities are never solely sort of shaped by our own understandings, but are sort of also refracting sort of how, you know, others see us and how we, you know, conceive of these deserving, undeserving categories out there, right? But I think the other question that I think is like, I think is is really central to this this debate, and I'd like us to sort of try to get at it because I do think it's important to to this. If there is a tension here, it, I think it might be partly there, which is, you know, do we normatively believe that a state I, a states have an obligation? that is different for people who are, um, you know, and, and I, I think we would probably all agree that the current refugee convention definition is too narrow. So the question of like, do we, not this specific definition, right? I think putting that question aside, because I think we could kind of get into that quite, and I think actually one of the, the, the participants is asking us to do that, to talk about sort of climate induced and conflict induced. I think we could probably sort of spend a whole amount of time just on that definition, but recognizing that that's a sort of a problematic and outdated definition, but recognizing that if, you know, some form of coercive uh, movement, do states have an obligation, a differential obligation to, to certain groups moving for versus others? 
And I think a related question, which I think isn't the same, which is do states have the right to use force to prevent and coercion to prevent entry from all migrants, right? So I think the kinds of harms and the, the things that we see, for example, all around the world, but you know, maybe particularly in, for, for many here in the audience, like in the United States, uh, I think we can stand very, very clearly and say, you know, that states do not have the right to use coercive means or, uh, uh, you know, uh, externalization and these are to, uh, to limit access to all migrants, right? That's different than say, then do you, how do you process, you know, how do you then adjudicate between different claims? Um, and then do states have an obligation that is different for different drivers of, you know, so, so I, I feel like that is an important distinction here uh, for the normative argument, right? Um, and if we, if we don't believe that states have different obligations to people moving for either more coercive or less coercive reasons, then I think, you know, then we, you could end up in a different place on this, on this question. Um, any other quick reactions? I think this is a good time for me to also just layer on a couple more questions, some from the audience. One I'm seeing from Andrea Pena Vasquez. Um, love to hear, have a discussion about the racial dimensions of these labels. Um, they're bringing in, you know, the very recent events of Haitian asylum seekers who are, as we see in the media and public discourse, characterized as economic migrants. Um, and so this, the anti-Blackness in the global North and how that, you know, also layers itself onto the, the labels. Um, and Lama, you had mentioned the question from Fiona Barker, climate-induced migration, conflict-induced migration. That's something I've been struggling with myself. I'm like, is this the better way of, of discussing this, saying just being more specific about what type of migration rather than labeling the people, labeling the migration. Um, okay, a, lo a lot more questions, but I'll, I'll leave it here. Just adding a few more questions, please react to each other. I'll also have my thoughts later. I'm still collecting them. <laughs> Rebecca. So I really appreciate um, Lama kind of distilling the question and I, and I'm like hesitant to answer her question just because I'm not 100% sure about it. But the more I think about it, the more I do feel like to the extent that there is a system in the world that is based around saying states have the sovereign right to control their borders and keep people out, except for asterisks, this group. However, we define it, it will be defined in a way that excludes the vast majority of people who may or may, um, or at least the majority of people who may want to travel. And so it's difficult for me to see, to imagine a world that has a category like that and doesn't have border violence, doesn't have exclusionary policies. Um, this was a big part of the conversation um, at a author meets critics panel that I had with David Fitzgerald um, this past summer who wrote Refuge Beyond Reach because I asked him like, isn't, aren't the policies that you're describing just sort of inevitable byproducts of this regime? Like, could you imagine a world with one and not the other? And he said he could, I just, I don't know if I can. And so, and so the, the reason I was hesitant to say this before is because then what, because I know the first question we got in the comments was what's the policy prescription? Um, and so I don't know the answer, but I do think that um, creating a category that is by definition more deserving than others is going to, I think inevitably um, lead to violence. And it may be the case that the calculation is that that is, a better outcome than open borders and chaos <laughs> and mayhem that may result from open borders. But 
I guess I would prefer to have being recorded. That. So I'm wondering if I can just. I don't know what just happened. Just um, a reminder to mute to other you know, things. What a nice phone. So I guess I would rather have that conversation about is there a way <laughs> to do this um, than to assume that there's you know an answer already out there. And so that's why I appreciated what Lama said. Um, I'll try to jump in because <laughs> I feel I, but both both Rebecca and Lama I think are asking really difficult questions that of course I think we all struggle with in our work. And and I do think there's I don't know, it's, it's not, it's not that I separate, you know, my academic work from like more normative uh, policy focused work, but I think when, when speaking to different audiences, we can kind of um, maybe think about these questions, um, maybe slightly differently, but I think, so I, I tried to distill my book um, into a, like a 4,000 word article <laughs> this summer for this, this, um, uh, Perry Worldhouse uh, foreign affairs piece that I guess eventually allegedly will at some point be published in foreign affairs, although I don't know when. But anyhow, I, I think I, I try to think about this question because it really does, uh, I think all of our work on this topic necessitates it. And I think, you know, some of the questions from the audience get at it. What about, what about race? What about, as Rebecca said, it's, you know, effectively the system of border controls preserves this colonial world based on race, based on, based on economic wealth and distribution of that wealth. Um, and can we imagine a world that is more equitable and does that necessitate open borders? And I, I think I take sort of a halfway house answer in the essay in that I think that we can certainly pinpoint that the world in which we're, we're currently operating is not, not getting us any closer to that, to, the, to a more equitable space, right? And that border controls are, are working to reinforce that. Um, and I try to argue based on the research in my book, which looks at Egypt, Morocco, and Turkey and the externalization regimes we've seen from Europe and the impact that has had in those domestic uh, spaces, um, that that's not working. It's not working for Europe. It's not working for these countries that are sort of recipients of some of those policy prescriptions. And it's not working for, for migrants or refugees or individuals on, on the move who are ending up in, in some of these places. Um, but what I do say is that, that it's not, it's it, that acknowledging that this is not working and maybe some politicians would in you know, the US context or European context would disagree, but from, from the, the vantage point of most people I think involved or have who have sort of skin in this game, it's not working. Um, and perhaps a way towards that is um, not necessarily, I mean, I think broadening this, this category that we currently have this incredibly narrow category of refugee is, is not, a, is, is a step in, in the right direction, but obviously will not acknowledge or will not uh, rectify the, the situation we have, which as Rebecca said, is keeping the vast majority of people out of accessing um, countries in the global north. But uh, finding other ways that people might uh, be able to be more legally mobile is really the way forward, right? So that's not just, you know, not just some small pathways, but really revamping the entire system of visas, right? I mean, the, the, the fact that people from the global north can access mo mobility across the world and don't need visas to go almost anywhere is just inherently unequal and, and not sustainable. And we'll, we'll continue to see the same sort of pressures uh, that we have, political pressures, um, and otherwise in terms of migration, if, if that is not rectified. And it's the only way to create a more, I guess, racially, economically, socially just world is to come up with uh, a more legally mobile world for the vast majority of, of people. But again, this is going much more into the normative space and away from, I guess, the original intention of this conversation, which was like, how do we, how do we use labels? <laughs> so I'm sorry for going so far afield. No, I mean, I, th I think this is really helpful. I have one more question, um, but while I'm asking that, to the audience members, I think this is a good time. If you want to raise a question yourself, start putting up your little hands. I think it's in the reactions button. Um, and then I'll call on you. Can, you can ask your question directly. Um, uh, okay, so I, I think to right now this conversation, as Kelsey, as you said, it's gone into a normative sphere. And I think that's, you know, of course it is because as scholars, we're also 
there's also implications of the language we use in policy spaces. We are advocates, to, you know, on what we want to advocate. Um, my other question was, you know, I often use qu like quantitative data, data that has already been collected by organizations like the World Bank and the UNHCR. When we're talking about states, host governments, they strategically deploy these terms, you know, sometimes to commit violence. Um, and what about these organizations that ostensibly really care about this group of people, at least, you know, the, that's what they, <laughs> um, that, that's what they seem to want, um, like the UNHCR and the World Bank, when I'm using their data, they have labeled people, right? And there's numbers attached to how many people are refugees, how many people are asylum seekers. On the one hand, I've been trying to practice this radical transparency for like, if I'm writing a white paper for the World Bank, they've given me a list of terms and they're like, these are the terms that are, that we use and, you know, to, to make sure it's comparable and readable to our audience, you have to use these terms. I'll use the terms, but also have a footnote being like, hey, this is a term that they told me to use, but here's some problems. Um, can we do like, you know, but we're scholars here, they're reading our work, what can we do more to push back against that? I'm trying to think, you know, aside from the just being transparent in our work, can we collectively get something closer to changing the language now that I have all of you here and I feel like, you know, we're at the forefront of thinking about this. Um, that's my question. I mean, I'm basically here selfishly to just get advice from you guys. <laughs> Um, and I'll turn it back to you, but yeah, also feel free to raise your hands if you have questions that you want to read aloud. I'm seeing a lot of stuff in the chat and I'm going to look through that too. Thanks. Just, uh, can I add, sorry, Mama, do you want to go? No, no, go ahead. So. Just one small point on, on some things that have come up about deservingness being sort of central to our conversation. And I wonder if one thing that we could do is flip the conversation around what we see as a detrimental conversation around deservingness to different levels of protection. And that doesn't imply that some people get no protection or that violence can be used against some people and not others, but perhaps what we are describing are different levels of needed protection. Um, and that doesn't take necessarily agency away from anyone because you, you may need protection, but still be able to do all these other things. But as much as I am working against um, or am thinking a lot about how we have overemphasized non refoulement in so much of where we are today depends on this overemphasis on non refoulement there does seem sort of some core of truth in the existing state system that there is a level of protection where you can't go anywhere. Um, that seems like we need to find a solution. And so that, that provides additional, additional protection, not that you are more deserving, but sort of thinking in levels of protection. Um, and, and the second point on, on legal pathways, I, I will always be on my, until new data comes, my medium term solution for now is challenging people to think about legalizing regional mobility pathways. And I think others agree with this as well. Um, and I, you know, in Tanzania and Burundi and a lot of places in East Africa, there is fluid movement across borders, both for, at, you know, to go and sell at market, to go and visit relatives, to, for, for, um, political reasons, all of these things that is allowed, but not necessarily legalized. Um, and perhaps formally legalizing these pathways and providing some sort of option for additional protection to those who may otherwise qualify in some sort of refugee category for their inability to return is a way to move forward progressively with the recognition of what both Rebecca and Kelsey have said is that which of until we move forward radically, we're not gonna have, we're still gonna have violence. Um, so just as an answer of in the meantime, what can we think about? 
Um, Yang Yang, I think you're, uh, Stephanie, thank you so much for your comments too. So I'm not, not trying to skip over that, but just to, to um, kind of address the, the question that uh, Yang Yang raised. I think uh, this is a difficult topic because uh, these institutions have so much at stake, right? In terms of these categories, <laughs> in terms of their protection mandates, right? Or in terms of the IOM, you know, with organized migration and differentiating between uh, people that they can return home and those who are entitled to stay. Um, so I think that's a, I think, I mean, it's, I think especially with like smaller NGOs working in this, in these same spaces, at least in, in the um, countries where, where I've done research, there's a lot more understanding. And I mean, I think there is even maybe amongst larger organizations, but they're willing to say that, you know, maybe in privately or informally, but not so much in written publications. Um, and I can't say I've, I've written for either of those organizations or the World Bank. Um, so I'd actually be curious to hear just, you know, you posed the question, but maybe you could just say in terms of what you've done uh, in terms of a response or how you go about um, mitigating or negotiating uh, those labels. Um, because I imagine that there's, you know, quite a, a staunch um, understanding of, of uh, how we divide people into various categories. Um. I want to pick up on this because I think, you know, Yang Yang, to your point, and I, I don't think this is what you meant, but, you know, as much as states have and sort of invested the interest in categories, I would say, you know, organizations like UNHCR and, and the World Bank may have even more vested claims, you know, vested reasons, some of which are because of their interactions with states and the ways in which they have to, uh, you know, uh, for example, like the World Bank you know, and its work in Lebanon has had to make, you know, has, I know, not published certain reports that, you know, have not necessarily fit into a particular narrative that the Lebanese national government wants to put out and, you know, will take in, will take, say, UNHCR's labeling of, of Syrians and the fact that since mid-2015, Syrians haven't been able to register as refugees in Lebanon. Uh, my co-author, Maya Yanmir, has written a lot about this in the context of, of sort of UNHCR and actually just has a really great piece out on, uh, on, um, on Sudanese uh, refugees and, and sort of the non-Syrians in, in the Middle East, you know, and the way in which they're categorized. But one, one example that actually was, that came up uh, recently for me that I was thinking about was the category of Venezuelans uh, displaced abroad and thinking about, you know, actually one of my students asked me this in class and I was like, this is such a good question, right? It's like, why does UNHCR have this category? It's kind of this category that, that appears over the last, and you would expect that UNHCR would be vested in having more, you know, forced migrants and refugees under its its umbrella and having you know but there are clearly also other pressures to not recognize venezuelans as quote unquote legitimate refugees and that's you know unhcr is is putting that in writing in their reports right and that's something that's really important to recognize and to challenge right um so i think again coming back to this idea that so much of this i think is about always, even when it's subjectivities, and even when it's, you know, always recognizing, you know, what is this category doing? Like, what is the work that this category is doing in this particular instance? And, and, and challenging it that way, not recognizing because categories, I think, you know, will continue to exist, right? I think it's just the question is, how do we interrogate their uses and the work that they do and never take them as a given? right, as a sort of real essence, right, to, to Rebecca's point about sort of the essentializing nature. And I think that is where the work really can, can kind of go. And, you know, I, I would love to see UNHCR really push on this question of why Venezuela, you know, what, why this category? What is the political pressure that is being, uh, and, you know, coming back to Zetter's formative work on this, right, the way in which international organizations have started to take on uh, state forms of labeling right over time right and i think this is a you know a particular incarnation of that thank you that that is such an important reminder you know of course these organizations are not apolitical or neutral um rebecca that was all i was really going to say it's just i think again with a radical <laughs> a commitment to this but Stephanie, was it you who used this phrase first in this conversation? Thank you. Radical transparency around the idea that, that 
numbers and data are not politically neutral, that they're constructed as well. And I, I you know, I review a lot, I read a lot of uh, articles or drafts of articles in this field. And so many of them start with, there are blah, 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 there are X, Y, Z number of refugees in the world today. Moving on as if that, I don't know, I just, <laughs> at least I would love to see a footnote on a, a statement like that. Like, why are you starting with that? Why are you starting with this number? What does the number mean to you? Um, who made the number <laughs> and why did they make it? Um, I think would be really, really refreshing. Lisa. I'd love to see just a little bit more interrogation of the data. And I understand that there's a place for that and it may not be in a, a report <laughs> for a World Bank, but even just a footnote I think would be just really helpful in getting us out of that mindset that it's so easy to slip into that the numbers speak for themselves. I mean, to be honest, I'm sure I have a sentence like that. And right after this, I'm going in and and, and, and doing a little write-up. That's that's super helpful. Bef um, I'm, I'm getting so many things in the chat. This is amazing. If you have a question, please raise your hand. I think that's allowed, although I don't see hands raised. And I so I hope that function is working. If it's not, please somebody tell me. Um, I've gotten some DMs just for clarification. So really quickly, let me do some clarifications. Um, Jacqueline Levers asked me if we could go over some of the terms and labels that we've mentioned. I think we just like kind of skirted right through it and just assumed everybody knows. I mean, some of these labels, of course, we're saying refugee, migrant, and usually that binary is refugee versus like economic or voluntary migrant, um, terms like forcibly displaced. There's also, you know, terms like returnee or internally displaced, border crosser. Um, I'm sure there's, you know, th those are the big ones that I'm thinking of. If, if I'm missing any, please panelists jump in. Um, someone else asked me about, uh, Stephanie, you had mentioned using the terms flood. And just to give a background for audience members who don't know, this is um, for a long time, migrants have uh, the, the media and the language around migration and migrants. We've been using a lot of water metaphors. So I think this is what Stephanie's talking about. So basically words like a flood of people, influx, deluge, all the sort of um, descriptors you would use with water, we've been seeing it placed on human beings and how that is very dehumanizing um, to, to label bunches of people, like, you know, groups of people as a flood. Um, please jump in if I'm missing anything there. Um, all right, I see that Liz Nugent had a question, Liz. Thanks. Um, thank you all so much. Um, it's really interesting to hear you all in conversation because your work has been um, so interesting to read, but the, the dynamic conversation is even better. Um, so I'm asking this question, I guess, on my behalf and also on Emmy Madison's behalf, because we're doing um, kind of a little reading group on this idea of exiles and where they fit into international studies of migration. Um, and we find, you know, it, Obviously, this is probably not going to be a surprise to any of you, but they show up in so many different ways in so many different places. Um, you know, they show up as migrants, workers, students, refugees, spouses, um, right? And it seems like the the binary and kind of the implications of that binary means that economic instability gets recognized and physical instability gets recognized. But the idea of kind of who deserves protection for their political beliefs is clearly, you know, there's the sending state, there's the host states, there's a ton of politics involved with that. And so I was just curious, you know, is there some place that we should be reading more about this? Um, is there, I guess, some consensus about, about kind of where political migration fits in when it's not clearly economic or physical insecurity? And then finally, specifically for, now I'm getting very selfish, um, we look quite a bit at Islamists, um, so in addition to kind of racialized aspects of migration, Islamists are often, you know, considered an unsavory category because they're very conservative um, for lots of other reasons, right? But how do we think about kind of those adjectives being tacked on to exiles as well that complicates even more um, this whole process and this whole categorization? Thank you so much. <laughs> 
I mean, I'm just going to jump in because it's funny. I was just, uh, our, my class last night was about Islamism, uh, is, Islamist politics. And, <laughs> and then I, I'm presenting a paper tomorrow about like Egyptian ex exiles, ex exiles. Anyway, so it's, uh, you're, you're very much in my brain, Liz. Um, but, I, you know, I, I, I struggle from a similar phenomenon. And I think I'd love to hear Beth's response after I just say something, because you were kind of the one in the initial remarks talking about um immigrants and and the diaspora literature and how we use those labels um i'll just say like from my own beginning research on on this uh, new project that um it i mean i think it's going to run into the same difficulties as, as we've been discussing i mean as you probably are, are already struggling with yourself liz that of course people just because they might have left for political reasons and thus would seem to fit under you know easily under the 1951 categorizations of people that are you know, uh, evading uh, political persecution. Of course, it doesn't play out in practice and people have, it's really hard to get asylum. <laughs> so many, like the people I've been speaking with, none, none of whom have um, political asylum despite having pretty, what would seem to be pretty clear cut reasons for, for leaving um, dangerous situations where they were individually persecuted, right? Um, by the government. So I think, I think probably just as as we've kind of been saying throughout just being critical of of the categories and and having a discussion and whatever you're writing about the various reasons why someone might not easily qualify um, under traditional um, categories of, of refugees or asylum seekers or asylees um, or even exilees uh, so I think again I guess just I mean yeah, that's a, that's what I'm planning to do but I'd love to hear other people's responses as well just kind of being very critical of, of these um, categories and the ways that they're deployed either by the state or in our own writing. Um, I think Steph you might have just waved I don't know if you want to okay um uh this, this such yes the, the question of exiles um I uh, comes into my work as well uh, especially when you're thinking about the political incorporation of um emigrants as well as you know the formation of political parties or um political um movements out and mobilization outside of a state's territory um I often you know when I I often I, I think it often gets down to the level of analysis in terms of if you're um thinking about exiles as like self-designated exiles versus if states have designated particular categories of people like affiliated with you know banned political parties or um or you know political opposition in general um how like who is construct who is defining um, particular people or particular groups of people as exiles? Um, I think often a lot about these questions through the lens of um, the Zimbabwean community in South Africa and how you know, for example, one of the you know larger civil society organizations um, you know during the you know early two thousands was called the Zimbabwe Exiles Forum, and how um, that you know terminology was you know taken up by a particular group of people, um, you know, to kind of designate them, you know, within this context of whether there's political or economic motivations for leaving. Um, I think, and also in turn, the question, you know, uh, you know, South Africa has gone to major, major lengths to designate Zimbabweans as not, you know, um, other than specific individuals as not, um, quote unquote, deserving of refugee status um, and also has um, worked in partnership with a number of the global migration organizations, either, you know, behind the scenes as well as, um, you know, kind of really kind of trying, you know, really trying to at attempt to construct the category of Zimbabwe and migrants as overwhelmingly economically motivated. Um, and so I think, again, this, this question of positionality, this question of who is making these designations, um, as well as, uh, like what work they're doing on the ground um, is really, really critical. Okay, we have five minutes left in this panel. I wish we can go on forever. Um, I just, Stephanie, I'm going to shoot it over to you, but um, I just wanted to layer on like maybe two more audience questions and have you answer those questions, Stephanie. Um, uh, I'm seeing in the chat box uh, a question or a conversation from Rowan Arar and also Lily Frost. Um, Rowan and Lily, would you like to um, say your questions aloud to the panelists, and then we'll we'll have them close out. I think they're both questions about language. I can also try reading them, but it'd be great if Lily, go ahead. I feel like we, I was just responding to the conversation that was going on. Uh, so 
I'm, oh I'm okay. yeah, I'm no, and I was just kind of inputting my thoughts, um, and of course, doing a little multitasking as one does um, when you're prepping to teach <laughs> right beforehand. But anyway, so my question is mainly about kind of like thinking about what these distinctions mean, and that from a legal perspective on the one hand, and then from kind of more of like the everyday practice life of these individuals on the other hand, and. I kind of started out the question thinking about like, how can we maybe preserve the good aspects of the legal protections um, while also doing more to address kind of the negative consequences of them in this conversations about deservingness and the different ways that these terms become politicized and different aspects of racism and ethnic discrimination and all and religious discrimination, as Elizabeth just pointed out, like all these different forms of discrimination that can emerge from them. And then I kind of ended up at this point of like, can we do that though? Um, is there something actually about the legal frameworks that need to be kind of fundamentally changed or not? So I think kind of like Stephanie, I, I want to think about ways to protect the people that I study. And so I've tended to think about interim solutions. Um, so I guess this question could be taken kind of theoretically. Is there a way to have um, more of this radical transparency within existing legal frameworks? And you can take that to be international or domestic. In the context I work in, there's basically no domestic legal framework and very little adherence to international ones. So sometimes this, this concept itself is, is uh, troubled, uh, at least in my own research. Um, so kind of like policy wise, or you can take it theoretically where it's kind of, is it, is it possible? So it's, it's a big open question that you don't have to answer. Um, and I was kind of just in searching into the chat because it's something I'm thinking of and would love to talk uh, about much more later uh, with each of you. Thanks. Thanks, Lily. I know Lily personally, which is why I felt very comfortable just calling her out. Um, all right, we have ooh, one, two minutes, uh, Stephanie. <laughs> I certainly can't answer that question in one two or two minutes, and I don't know that I can answer that question. Um, I can just say a little bit about what I am, not just what I have done in the past, but what I'm trying to think about how to commit myself moving forward, because I think that this is an ongoing changing practice for myself as well. Um, I, I'm trying to think about both my own advocacy um, as well as my own writing um, and concentrating my advocacy <laughs> um, in my lane is looking at the interaction between repatriation and labeling and the migrant um, <clears throat> refugee binary and, and the role it plays there and, and kind of what I've witnessed and studied personally in that lane and the deployment of those labels and in my broader advocacy, I tend to, I guess where I'm gonna go forward is to be a bit more self-critical of what I'm doing there um, because I really don't have the answer yet to, to what you're describing in terms of can we keep both. Um, I would also say just really quickly, Liz, I think it's an important question about exiles in the role of politics um, as the beginning of this, of the whole 1951 convention, was, and its evolution after World War II was largely all about politics and communism. And I always teach Rebecca's piece on this, um, your 2012 article in my class. And that um, it, if it's no longer there, that's a really interesting finding in and of itself um, for, for what you're studying. And I would just bring it back that polit it, politics is not absent in security and politics is not absent economics. And certainly it's not been absent in the refugee definition either. Thank you so much. I, um, I would love to give last words to every panelist, but I think we have to go to the next panel. I'm very sorry about that, but thank you. Let, let's give a round of applause to all of our panelists. This was a really productive, helpful conversation for me. I hope it was for you. I hope we can continue the conversation in another venue, hopefully in person. Thanks. Thanks so much, everyone. And this thanks, is recorded. Okay. It'll be online. Um, please save the chat. There's so many good resources in the chat.